All right, so this is episode number five, Into the Absurd with Bryce Blankenship. And then you, uh, so what have you been doing here at the university? Yeah, so thanks for having me participate. I'm excited to, to get into this. It'll be fun. Um, so I'm a senior instructor in the Department of Politics and Philosophy at the University of Idaho. Um, and I've been teaching in various capacities. I've been teaching philosophy in various capacities for about nine years. Uh, so I finished my master's in 2013, um, was teaching kind of as a graduate student during that time frame. And then in the past seven years, I've kind of been bouncing around between lecturer, temporary lecturer, instructor, and then kind of in the past three years, I've been um, a senior instructor. So really good gig teaching the 100, 200 level classes, um, kind of spanning a whole host of differing topics, which is kind of fun. Um, yeah. Like I have my I have my own interests, but then, you know, especially teaching, like the class that I always teach every semester uh, is Philosophy 103, which is Intro to Ethics. Um, and in that class, I mean, we touch on a lot of different philosophies and a lot of different um, topics that maybe I don't feel particularly strong in some of them, but I feel particularly strong in others. And yeah, so it's kind of fun. And I'm always a little bit on my toes. You know, yeah. you're always learning something new. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's fun where, you know, some people ask me because I teach the 100, 200 level classes, you know, and, and so those classes encapsulate uh, the following. Either classes I've taught or am teaching uh, philosophy 103, intro to ethics, philosophy 200, uh, which is the philosophy of alcohol, which I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit more here in just a bit. A class <laughs> that I've gotten more um, particularly interested in and passionate about the last couple of years. Uh, philosophy 201, which is critical thinking. Philosophy 221, which is philosophy and film, which I just taught for the first time this past semester. And philosophy 240, which is belief in reality, which I've taught um regularly for uh probably four years now every semester so yeah so i'm kind of all over the place which is fun uh, and i typically have um 150 to 200 total students every semester so yeah cool yeah no i took your belief in reality class and that class was awesome yeah hell yeah yeah no you, you took that a couple of years ago, yeah? I mean, yeah. Probably two or three. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. And so you're also interested in um, environmental philosophy. Mm -hmm. So can you uh, kind of explain what yeah. that's all about? Yeah, so I, uh, my emphasis in my master's work was environmental philosophy. So my master's is in philosophy with an emphasis in environmental philosophy. And I honestly, you know, to be honest, like in the past couple of years, I haven't been super active in that field. Like I'm kind of aware of various literature and various kind of um, avenues of various philosophical takes on environmental discussions. Um, but my engagement has been shifted a bit in the past couple of years. But in 2012 to 2015, um, that was definitely an area that I was most kind of passionate about, which is essentially asking those questions, you know, those, those philosophical questions about the environment, right? And they can be ethical, they can be moral, um, they can be value laden, right? All sorts of kind of like differing discussions on how ought we engage with the environment, right? Do we have a responsibility, um, to behave particular ways as a, you know, relates to environmental practices, you know, and then and when we think about environmental practices, do we think about them on like the macro scale or the micro scale, right? From like the own individual lives or, you know, um, the emission of CO2, whatever the case may be. Um, and I've, I haven't taught an environmental philosophy class. I would like to, because I think it would be really enjoyable to get back immersed in the topic, but uh, it hasn't happened yet, but maybe it will. Um, I've been to a couple of environmental philosophy conferences. Um, and I mean, again, these topics can go so many different directions, which is enjoyable. But one funny little story that I like to tell is I was in this conference, and this was, I think, 2014. And I went out to lunch with like 10 people. And, you know, it's fun to think of lunch with 10 people in a COVID world. Um, <laughs> oh, my gosh, what we used to do. And I went out to lunch and there was 10 of us, and we all went to this environmental philosophy conference. And 
typically environmental philosophers for logical, justifiable, well thought out reasons are typically either vegan or vegetarian. Um, I've been surrounded by those arguments for a long time. I've tried to, you know, maybe implement those dietary decisions sporadically. Um, but I'm, I'm decidedly not vegan or vegetarian as a very, pardon me. I'm not, I'm decidedly not vegan or vegetarian. Um, even though I know a lot of really reasonable and probably worthwhile arguments to be, but anyway, this conference, we're not to lunch with these 10 people. We're all sitting around the table. They're all either vegan or vegetarian and like they're going around and, you know, ordering salads or ordering this with like modification of like, you know, no chicken or whatever the case may be comes to me and I order like a chicken sandwich. And so I was the only person that like ordered meat, you know, in this whole group of 10, which then we went on for like an hour and a half to discuss, you know, ethical treatment of animals <laughs> and like it dove into this like, you know, deeply like, you know, and I mean, it was a pretty like comical, like you abstract from the experience and it's like a pretty comical scene, right? Yeah. You have one, you know, quote unquote meat eater and the rest, you know, non meat eaters. But that's just like one avenue that has a long, again, literature um, and environmental philosophy. Um, but but the, the topic can go so many different directions. Yeah, no, uh, I'm just thinking of this in, so I know we read Ishmael mm -hmm. in Belief in Reality, and that's mm -hmm. kind of where I was introduced to environmental philosophy. Yeah, good. Um, I never even knew that it, it was a thing, mm -hmm. really, until mm -hmm. that class. Um, but so... I recently watched your TED talk. Mm -hmm. It was in 2016, like mm -hmm. why authenticity will save your life. Mm -hmm. So why will it do that? Save my life. Yeah, good. Um, so a couple of things here. Um, I wanted the title to be changed <laughs> for the record. Um, yeah, I yeah. I would have I would have much rather have had something along the lines of like authenticity and no excuses like that that i think much more fits into what i actually talk about in the dead talk um but i think just because things were printed the way that they were and i wasn't able to change the title it got printed that way that it, it did um which probably and I, I don't know if i'm making an excuse right now but i'm just providing supplemental uh context i guess um but I do, I still do think that authenticity can make your life more fulfilling. Yes. And if that, and if more fulfilling is equated to um, saving it or making it more enriched, then yeah, I do think that the title works. And I do think that authenticity and being authentic um, can, in fact, do a number of things. And so in the TED Talk, I discuss my outlook which is really similar, or at least it's inspired by Jean-Paul Sartre's kind of outlook on, on our existence, right? And yeah. Sartre, you know, fundamentally thinks that we are, are free. Like at the nature, like uh, at the base of everything, like our existence can be defined and understood in terms of our freedom, right? And, and the way that our freedom is most manifest in the world is through the choices that we make. Right. Yeah. And and so this idea that for Sartre, he thinks that the primary condition of human existence is freedom. But what follows freedom is responsibility. So for Sartre, and I think it's like a really provocative claim. Is that for Sartre, everything is a choice. And like and like this is like, I think, doubly uh, liberating and terrifying. Right. Because it means and I think this is Sartre's point is it means that like, again, at the base of everything, like we are responsible for ourselves, we're responsible for our engagements and our relations with others, we're responsible for the world we all create, because like fundamentally the world we create is through us choosing this, that, or the other, right? And so as it relates to like authenticity uh, and, and ways that I've been thinking about authenticity over the years, again, kind of promoted by Sartre is, and I think, you know, part of this is because I'm a teacher and I feel like uh, uh, I hear often from students like, oh, I have to get this assignment done. Oh, I have to go to work. Oh, I have to go back to my fraternity house. Or, oh, I have to go, you know, um, meet this person for this thing. And so, like, as I was paying more attention, I noticed 
kind of what I called like these have tos, quote unquote, right? Like, you know, in the examples that I just gave that I think a lot of us, uh, I think a lot of us kind of live lives according to the have tos and kind of critiquing this notion of the have tos from a Sartrean perspective is what I challenge in the TED talk, which is the idea that instead of like, anytime we have the inclination that like, anytime we have the inclination to say, I have to, and then fill in the blank, I have to X, whatever X is, right? My challenge is like, well, what if we just change that ever so slightly to like, I am choosing to, or more simply like I am, right? In the very like affirmative sense, right? And this idea that that like little reframing, I actually think is like really provocative because it shifts the responsibility or it shifts the motivation, not from that thing that's outside of ourselves, like work or, um, you know, going back to your frat, going to the gym, whatever the case may be, but it shifts that focus on ourselves, on our own ability to make those choices, right? And so in the TED Talk, I think about authenticity in terms of replacing those have tos with I am choosing to or I am, right? Where there's a greater kind of importance and and focus, maybe not just importance, but focus put on our own ability to direct our lives, right? And and so the way that that like, you know, manifests is like, okay, I am choosing to go to the gym. I am choosing to go hang out with my fraternity brothers. I'm choosing to go to work, right? Because like in a way, much of our life, even when we don't think we have choices, we still have choices. And that's another kind of unrelenting part of Sartre's existentialism, right? And anytime I deny choice or I deny or think I don't have any choice, right, I'm acting in what Sartre calls bad faith. But again, that's another kind of direction we can go. So suffice it to say, uh, I now I get a little long-winded here, but most philosophers do. Um, That's good, though. Yeah, thanks. Um, but suffice it to say, I think that authenticity, at least like trying to, trying to at least reframe the way we navigate through the world in terms of I am choosing to rather than I am having to, can really undoubtedly, I think, really give one a greater sense of confidence, a greater sense of self-awareness, a greater sense of agency. So if that's equated to saving your life, then sure, it might be able to save your life, right? But I think that, that more than anything, what it can do is that it can really, again, give one a better kind of existential appreciation for the way that one moves through the world. And right, it's freedom. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I and I try this in my own life, right? I mean, this is not just like, you know, I throw it out there and I'm like, all right, see ya, I have to go back to my office, right? I don't, like, I honestly, like, really think that, and it's something that I've been trying for, you know, I think that, yeah, like, as you said, the TED Talk was in 2016 and I had been kind of working on, on some of these thoughts probably from 2015 on, so about five years, like, I, I honestly really try to not live in the have tos. Now, does that mean that I always live authentically? No, because I think authenticity is a really difficult thing, but I feel like this is one step to maybe get closer to living authentically. So, yeah, no, I think, um, to Sartre kind of points out that we're condemned to be free. And that's why we suffer. Mm -hmm. So when people say these have tos, that's them trying to get rid of some of their freedom, right? They're putting, Absolutely. it's kind of this concept of responsibility. Absolutely great. Yeah. And I think, yeah, and, and that's absolutely right. Right. Then whenever I, and like a really good example that usually gets a lot of pushback in the classroom is like that phrase, like, oh, I have to go to work. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if we like work with that in like a Sartrean lens and, and so what that does, and I think, you know, Keenan on your, your point there, where it's like what that does, if I say I have to go to work, I'm putting the responsibility on work, making me go there. Right. And so I'm not at all really taking responsibility, you know, for myself choosing to have applied to where I applied, choosing to agree to do that job, choosing to um, adhere to the schedule that they 
give, whatever the case may be, right? Because like those are all choices along the way that you made in reference to pursuing that job, that career, that whatever they might be. Um, and, and so, you know, whenever we kind of, again, place responsibility outside ourselves, we're trying to, again, do this kind of like maneuver that, that we don't have that much agency, that much freedom, when in fact, again, starts unrelenting point is we are condemned to be free. And so really, like, I don't know if you like, and this is a crazy thing to say, just because it goes contrary to especially our Western way of thinking about work. Like if you have a day that you're just like, nope, nope, you know what? I am not going to show up to my job, right? Well, that's a choice. And if you make that choice, you have to be responsible for that choice. Therefore, be responsible for the possibility of being reprimanded, the possibility of being fired, right? But that doesn't escape or that doesn't, um, uh, but that doesn't mean that there is no choice. Right. Like the boss doesn't come to your house and like, you know, uh, hold you at will and say, Greg, all right, we're going to work. Right. Like mm-hmm. there's still agency involved that you could choose not to go to work. You can also choose to go to work. Exactly. Right. Right. And like when you go to work again, in that framework of thinking, I'm choosing to go to work, then you are responsible for the really shitty parts of the job, but you're also responsible for the really great things of the job, the people you get to meet, maybe the job you actually get to do. And it like, frankly, can feel more fulfilling, I think, right? Because like you recognize that there's probably a wide range of things that you could be doing, but you've chosen to still maintain this job. You've still chosen to do the duties in accordance with that job. And to that end, right, it might be more fulfilling work. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, one thing that I think with Sartre that is interesting and, and I, and in, in the classroom when talking about this, we sometimes get some pushback, but I mean, Sartre does kind of have this, like, and this is something that I've been thinking about more recently, but like there is a privileged aspect to Sartre's existentialism, right? I mean, I sit here in a, you know, biggish office with windows talking on a podcast, you know, as a senior instructor in philosophy where I've got a little bit more kind of liberty to dictate my time, right? Mm-hmm. I'm not someone that, you know, and I live, you know, I, I have middle-class lifestyle, all things considered. And, you know, so I'm not like down on my luck. I'm not, you know, trying to provide for multiple kids, yada, yada, yada. And so there is like, I think some resistance that we, not resistance, but there is some angles that we have to pay close attention to with Sartre of like, is this just a whimsical idea? Because what about those people that really do live paycheck to paycheck or even in pandemic now that are just, you know, um, uh, relying on, on, on uh, unemployment checks every week. Like there's ways of like thinking about this framework with a little bit more pushback. However, excuse me, uh, Sartre wasn't naive to say like, you know, you're free to do whatever you want and it will always come true, right? He's very, very clear to the fact that like, yeah, you can make a lot of different choices, but like, will your like supposed ends actually result? Maybe, maybe not, right? And so, and there is something to also be said about the fact that like, deeper within Sartre's kind of focus on freedom is the freedom of consciousness, Right. So like, even if I did find myself, you know, let's say below the poverty line, working a job that I really disdained, that I didn't feel like I had any choice out of it. Right. Like if I really like think hard enough, like there is this kind of liberating aspect of like a freedom of consciousness that Sartre says, like you, you know, your will ought not be imposed by kind of the, the perhaps difficulty of your circumstance at present. Right. And Sartre knew this. I mean, he was imprisoned during World War II. Like, you know, he's physically imprisoned, but yet, you know, didn't let that necessarily debilitate his outlook, right? Um, That's that um, idea of, that kind of goes into the myth of Sisyphus, right? Like, Sisyphus, cho- he defies the gods by saying, hey, I'm choosing to push this rock up this hill for all of eternity. Right. And, and Camus parting line, I think, is something along the lines of, like, one cannot help imagine Sisyphus. One cannot help imagine Sisyphus but happy or something like that. Yeah. Right? Isn't that? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And I just, I mean, that line is, like, 
it's really powerful, right? It's like, yeah, but he's like Sisyphus is making that choice in a way to roll up and down and like, but yet that's the work he's doing, even if it's monotonous and boring and hard, right? Yeah. Yeah, he's choosing to kind of live, he's taking responsibility for his own, for bringing value to his own torture. Absolutely, right? absolutely. And I think the other little anecdote here, and and again, I think that there's 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 so many different avenues that this can be applied. I think both an existential lens, a psychological lens, um, and, and a relational lens, because I think, and Sartre kind of touches on this in a couple places more indirectly, but I think Sartre hits on a really interesting facet about like romantic relationships in this setup where, um, where myself and, and I know many often kind of find themselves in a relationship that, you know, started really well and, um, you know, has a couple of good months of that kind of like, you know, lust and kind of excitement and, and, you know, like, um, yeah, that really like wonderful time in a relationship when everything's new and exciting and fresh and, you know, over time, right. Over time, um, you know, you realize that maybe you're not as compatible as you thought you were with your partner or, you know, certain behaviors start to manifest. And we do this thing sometimes in relationships that we're like, well, I can't, I can't leave them because I've been with them for so long, or we've already built so much together that like, I can't, I can't make the decision to live without them or I can't make the decision to live independent of them. Or you sometimes see this in like, you know, dramatic cases of like abusive relationships where it's like, well, I just have no choice. I have to stay with him or with her. And again, Sartre's point is like, you can choose to get out of it. Like it's going to take a lot of work. It's going to be hard. It's going to be painful. It might be messy. You might have to involve others to help you with this, but like, we shouldn't tell our st- tell ourselves that we have to stay in unhappy marriages, unhappy relationships, right? And I feel like this happens often. And I think Sartre, again, kind of hits on a pretty powerful insight of, of human psychology and of human um, practices, I guess, maybe within monogamy, right? But there is something, I think, pretty interesting about the fact that so many people stay in unhappy relationships and unhappy marriages because they don't think there's a choice to get out of it. And again, Sartre would push back and say, no, like you do have a choice. Like it's going to, it's going to be hard, but you can try. Right. Yeah. And you need to take responsibility for your own life. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think a lot of people there, they don't want to cast, like they don't want to be responsible for someone else's suffering. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Or they think, Oh, well, it's going to get better. Right. 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 And these like kind of lies that we tell ourselves. Right. And, and the way, yeah, good. And like, there's this, like, again, this kind of like psychological move, these like lies that we tell ourselves in order to maintain the same kind of existence that we have right now, where it's like, Oh, it'll get better, but then it doesn't, but it'll get better, but then it doesn't. Right. That we kind of get in this trap where we, again, kind of like lie to ourselves when in fact, like maybe some like radical change needs to take place, even though like that's really hard to do. You know, especially in the context of like relationships or putting a job for that matter. And I think a lot of times people put the blame on the other person. Absolutely. Um, for things that are happening in the relationship and they just need to take responsibility on themselves. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And like, yeah, I mean, great. And I think that, yeah, that's great, Greg. Where it's it goes like, with friendships. Totally. You know, right? Just any relationship. Yeah, absolutely. Where you're like, oh, I can't believe he did this. I can't believe she did this. But then like, again, this kind of like flip almost to be like, well, what, what was my behavior? Or what was I doing that maybe encouraged their behavior or encouraged the way they responded? Right. But again, requires introspection requires, um, um, yeah, introspection and, and focus. And then also like in a way it ties back to one of your earlier questions. Like if we do become more aware of our choices and our behaviors, then maybe we can be more authentic, right? And we can recognize these tendencies in ourselves, these tendencies, uh, these tendencies that we seek out in relationships, right? So, yeah, I think, I mean, there's like, there's so much uh, that I think starts to like cast such a wide net that help, that that I think his outlook really helps as a um, 
framework to think about a lot of these things. And then are you interested in any other uh, philosophers, like existential philosophers? Yeah, I, uh, so I mean, yeah, Sartre is probably my intellectual hero, if that's the right phrase, uh, sometimes gets thrown around. Um, but I mean, every time I teach Nietzsche, I get so excited. Um, <laughs> yeah, like, me too. Yeah, yeah, like I, and actually one of my goals for this break is to reread I think it's at home, uh, but reread the spoke Zarathustra. Like that, like I, I in one of my classes we kind of went down some Nietzsche rabbit holes and started talking about the spoke Zarathustra. And it's probably been eight, nine years since I like read the whole thing. And so I'm just like, that's one of my goals is to like dive back into it. So, and I and I think with Nietzsche, again, this like focus and 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 energy. To like, uh, like encourage us, like deeply encourage us to all take better possession of ourselves, right? And I think that there's something like so, so powerful about this idea that most of us just kind of, again, go through the motions, do what's required of us, you know, live more or less fulfilling lives. But Nietzsche wants us to like live really fulfilling lives, right? And, mm -hmm. and to become even more alive than we actually are. And... And yeah, so Nietzsche is definitely up there. Um, as my interests in feminism have evolved over the years, I, I've, I've definitely been interested in Simone de Beauvoir um, and just kind of her connection, not just with Sartre, but her own kind of um, um, energy that, that really started like thinking about the relationship between men and women, males and females. Um, other thinkers... It's a good question. I mean, I, you know, in my belief in reality class, we read a thinker named Daniel Dennett, who's at Tufts University, um, kind of a philosopher of science. Yeah, he's an interesting dude. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he is. Um, the, the brain in the bat. Yeah, yeah, the uh, uh, where am I? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's so trippy. So <laughs> trippy. So, yeah. So, yeah, I actually had a student one semester. So this thought experiment is, is I'm going to yeah, yeah, speak go to it really, it. really, yeah, really quickly. Is this idea that uh, the army or someone, some governmental agency is like doing some experiments with nuclear warheads because that's what they do. And somehow a warhead gets lodged under Tulsa, Oklahoma. So the army decides the best course of action here before Tulsa, Oklahoma gets blown up is to send somebody down there to uh, send somebody down there to you know cut the wires, but the radiation is so powerful that like any human body, right, will surely be fried if they go down there. So this elaborate thought experiment is that Dennett, like Plain himself, uh, you know, they take his brain out of his body, put put it in a vat, and then essentially his brain in the vat controls the body of Dennett uh, with radio transmitters, right? And so classic philosophical, you know, mind-body problem, <laughs> classic, you know, thinking of, of, you know, where is the self located, if there, is, if there even is a self. Um, and, and so, yeah, classic representation of a brain in a vat controlling an independent body. Right, but they're connected through radio transmitters, and so then Dennett goes down into this hole again, brainless, but but uh, but has a body. Goes down this hole under Tulsa, and eventually, like his body, physical body, succumbs to the radiation, and his body just lays limp, and he like loses his body. Okay? But his brain's still active and alive back in Houston, Texas, at the in the back. So in a way. Dan Dennett still exists. So then the story goes on and says, all right, they found a new body, so let's say like a cadaver victim or something like that, right? Yeah. Put that up to the brain. And so now there's a new new body, same brain. Okay? And, you know, all the while, Dennett's like, yeah, no, I can get used to this new body. That's fine. All right, cool. Brain's there. Let's go check it out. And meanwhile, Dennett finds out that during this whole time frame, there's been a computer 
running alongside the brain's transmissions to mimic the brain's transmission. All right, so, so now we've got a computer that's mimicking the brain's transmission side by side. Yeah, and, and so what it does, right, and so then this plays another complexity. Because, like, the whole, the whole question is, like, where is Dennett? Like, is he in a physical body? Is he in the brain in the vat? And now the question is, well, is he this computer system, right? Like, this is all kind of, like, part of, like, this thought experiment. And there's this, like, master control switch that goes back between the brain and computer system and their outputs are indistinguishable. So we don't really know if Dennett is being run by the computer system or being run by the brain in the vat. And they, you know, cleverly kind of like talk about going on and off and falling down and yada, yada. And so essentially, uh, and then at the very end of the piece, um, you know, Dennett has his body, his brain's still in the vat and the computer's still running things as well. Um, and Dennett then had, well, at least the body, the new body, has control yeah. to be able to, like, turn the switch between the computer and the brain. But he doesn't know which one's the computer or the brain. And, and so it kind of, like, leaves the reader, you know, this kind of question of, like, well, where the hell is Dennett? Like, you know, is he being run by computer simulation or computer uh, program? Or is he being run by his brain and his vat? How much agency does his body have over kind of his brain or his computer program? And a couple of semesters ago, uh, in my belief in reality class, working through this thought experiment, a couple hours after class, I get this email from a student, and they're like, they're like, I have been thinking about this for the last X number of hours. And the student was like, now, I'm going to sound crazy, but was this a true story? <laughs> <laughs> they're, like, they're like, I called my parents to like talk about this. <laughs> and they were like, I called my parents, and my dad reassured me that there's no way that this was possible. But I just wanted to like let you know that like this really like boggled my mind. I thought it was a real story, that there was this body next to a warhead in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I was just like, oh my gosh. You know? <laughs> and, but, like, but in a way, I was like, well, part of the experiment, part of like the thought experiment is the fact that like we've never like felt our brains. We've never like, you know, we hit our skull. We don't know what's actually in there. We're told that our brains are in there. But are they? Could we just be being controlled with our brains somewhere else? Are we all part of just a computer program, right? Like these are the kind of trippy philosophical questions that can be pretty fun. Um, but yeah, the student was definitely bamboozled and like <laughs> honestly kind of thought that maybe uh, this was a like real story. And I just, I was like, okay, this is one of the joys of teaching. This was awesome. <laughs> so yeah, so that's definitely a pretty funny, funny, but like, meaningful uh yeah meaningful topic but it goes into that uh whole like what what are you who are you what is consciousness absolutely you know like what are all these things and what does it mean to be yeah something great and i mean uh i, I surely don't have the answers right um yeah, but, uh, 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 so that kind of goes back into the uh, sartre right with his whole I think it's existence comes before essence. Is yep. that what it is? Yep. Existence precedes essence. Yeah. Thing, yeah. Yeah. And, and like this idea that, you know, when Sartre thinks about kind of being, yeah, he thinks about it. I mean, existence preceding essence and, and the further kind of like unpacking of that language is like, you know, and this is a, this is a weird kind of critique on Western ideology. And when I say Western ideology, ideology, I mean, kind of Judeo-Christian, pardon me, Judeo-Christian influenced Western ideology that whether or not one's a practitioner of Judaism or Christianity, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to, hard to, hard to uh, claim that Judaism and Christianity haven't had an influence on culture and thoughts of self and thoughts of, of mm -hmm. identity. And there's the typical view in most religious contexts, right, that that, that, I mean, and again, this is like kind of provocative, 
but like the idea that like you know inherently we all have like meaning and value and like in the religious context it's like we all have god-given value right like god you know um like there, there's a purpose to your existence god you know wouldn't have brought you forth if if that's not the case and um so we think that like sometimes like essence like especially in the excuse me like um predominantly like religious outlook that essence like is the essence or being just is on the virtue of like existing right sartre flips that and he says that ultimately like at first we are nothing like we just are a physical biological entity that really has no again provocative claim here uh god given me right because like for sartre he's an atheist there is no god to have a conception of 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 a person right mm -hmm. and so again this like for a lot of people, I think terrifying, but liberating kind of outlook is the fact that like what gives our lives meaning, what gives this kind of like meaningless world meaning is our choices and how we choose to create it, what we choose to be, how we choose to be, right? And we're not all following like a script that was come that was given to us from on high or a script that, that, you know, we're all supposed to follow these rules, X, Y, and Z, but rather existence is much more fluid. It's much more free. It's much more um, possible than, than what a lot of conventions might otherwise state. And, and so this idea that Sartre's claim that like existence precedes essence or phrased differently, existence comes before meaning Right, is the idea that like at first we must exist and then like once we kind of like encounter ourselves then we like define ourselves afterwards that it's not god or some outside force defining who it is that we are but rather we ought to define who it is we are and we define who it is we are through the choices that we make or don't make for that matter so can you make choices when you're drinking alcohol, <laughs> nice, nice flip. I like this, <laughs> this, this, uh, this move. Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, all right. So let's let's dive into this. So, yeah, great, great. So, let's think about this, right? When we when we so I've been teaching this philosophy of alcohol class for a couple of years now. And I actually am. Uh, editing like a textbook of sorts to come out that, that we're going to use in, in a class actually this upcoming semester. Um, and I also have experience in like the food, uh, food, beverage, wine, cocktail world. You um, managed a wine bar. Right? Yeah, I managed a wine bar for a couple of years. Um, currently, I mean, currently in a pandemic, not so much, but like currently uh, I've been a craft cocktail bartender for about two and a half years. Um, so I've been like kind of in the world of, of wine, beer, and spirits for about a decade. Um, and so like that kind of like side of my interests compounded with like really interesting questions as it relates to alcohol use, alcohol consumption, um, alcohol's presence in all of our lives. And I think that that's kind of a first and fundamental kind of starting point that, that I start my philosophy of alcohol class with is that whether or not one has had a drink of alcohol, like whether or not one has had a sip of alcohol or nothing at all, I think it is undeniable to claim that alcohol has not had a presence in one's life, right? Whether that be at their home life or in culture and society, like we really are kind of a, a culture, especially in the States, a culture like saturated in alcohol, right? However, like, however you want to kind of conceive of that, whether that's in marketing, whether that's in um, movies, whether that's in, you know, your, again, own home life or how you were brought up, right? The fact that, you know, maybe every day uh, your mom had a glass of white wine and you didn't really know what it was, but you knew that it was there, right? Well, in what way or perhaps how has you know, the presence of alcohol shaped the way that we view just the topic of alcohol. One, that's the most kind of easy connection to ask. But how has alcohol just played a role in our reality? Like that's a the, huge role. Exactly, right? And 
So like one of the aims of like the philosophy of alcohol class is to take something that's so present in all of our lives. And that's again, one of my like, one of my like, I think starting claims, whether or not one's actually consumed alcohol or not, that's not the question. But because alcohol has played such a role in all of our lives to varying or lesser degrees, let's examine it, right? Like that's the, that's the point of the class. Like let's take this subject and do philosophy, which philosophy is peeling back the layers, unpacking it, digging in deeper, right? Which with some exception hasn't really been done, um, which hasn't really been done a ton in kind of the scholastic sense of just examining alcohol in like this very philosophically intentional way. I mean, I had no idea it was even a thing until you uh, made a class about it. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. And, and to the best of my knowledge, I don't think that there is another philosophy of alcohol class at any college or university. Um, to the best of my knowledge, there might be like some intersectionality and in like classes on addiction and, and, and maybe like psychology and, and other like disciplines, but, but an actual philosophy class. Yeah, yeah. Like this is to the best of my knowledge. And I haven't, you know, looked recently. Um, and one of the aims is that hopefully like with this textbook that I'm helping edit, then maybe more classes like adopt kind of a curriculum to offer this as a class because one, I think it's a topic that college students can get really interested in, right? Um, mm. And two, I think that it allows, through the topic of alcohol, um, it allows us to ask really meaningful philosophical questions. So back to like your initial question of, um, like, are you like, can you be yourself when you're drunk? Great. So my initial response here is like, when are we most ourselves? Right. And what does it even mean to be quote unquote yourself? And then thinking about that in terms of like the conversations or the topic of alcohol is actually twofold here, uh, probably threefold. One conversation we have in class, which I think is actually really interesting again, there's probably lots of intersectionality here, is like the nature of sobriety, mm -hmm. okay? So like, what does it mean to be sober, right? And like, I think that all of us, again, and when I say us, I mean kind of like culturally, United States of America, right? Um, like culturally, the United States of America, like uh, when we hear the word sober, we think that means not drinking, or we think that means maybe pure of alcohol, right? Or like, mm -hmm. you know, um, not influenced by the effects of alcohol or maybe drugs or whatever the case may be. Or it's any substance. Yeah, any substance, yeah. But I think that there's something really interesting about, like, again, doing a little bit of philosophy and pushing back on this. And, like, is it not the case that, like, our physical, our physiology and perhaps our, like, um, personality is influenced by what we ingest regardless if it's like an illicit substance or like a taboo substance right mm -hmm. and like my go-to example in class is like i am a different person after i've had a cup or two of coffee in the morning mm -hmm. like i can feel maybe a little sharper i can feel kind of like me stay a little bit more focused i've got a little bit more energy so undoubtedly this substance that i have consumed has changed my physiology right it's also changed a little bit of like my conception of self. Like I usually like after I have a cup of coffee, feel a little bit more like um, energized and, and not just like, like with, with actual energy, but like I'm just being like, yeah, I want to get this done. I'm like, this is cool. Like, you know, like I, I can feel my like mentality change a bit. Right. Yeah. And sure. The caffeine buzz isn't going to last all day. It's not going to be permanent, but I mean, I, I mean, I am, addicted to coffee like i'm gonna have have it every day and i know that like if i don't have coffee or caffeine maybe for that matter like i will get a headache but the point remains and i mean everything in moderation here yada 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 we can talk about that too but like the point remains is that like i would claim that i am changed by what i've ingested mm -hmm. right additionally like if i go out and i have you know if i go out and have you know, a pound and a half of, of chicken wings, I'm going to feel differently had I gone out and had uh, an arugula salad, 
right? Like the way that like what we ingest is going to affect like, again, our physiology, but also how we relate to the world. Or we just don't even eat anything. Exactly. Right. And so that again, great. And that again, like points to this, I think, interesting question of like sobriety. Like what does it mean to actually be sober? Mm -hmm. Right. Because your body is essentially made of drugs. Yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. That's all it is. Yeah. And, and like the way that like what we ingest or don't ingest affects that physiology. I think the question on sobriety becomes a lot more complicated. And so then that goes into like this question of like, so like we have sobriety on like one, we have sobriety here on one spectrum. And then we have, you know, again, those examples that I just gave of like chicken wings, arugula salad, coffee, you gave not eating, right? And like this compartment of like, okay, like what about these things that we ingest? Well, now let's go to alcohol. And sometimes like in this conversation, when we think about alcohol, obviously like other drugs get brought up, but I want to stay focused on alcohol. Yeah. Um, and so like with alcohol, right? If I have a beer or, and again, everybody's tolerance, everybody's, you know, um, response to alcohol is different, right? Um, but undoubtedly, if I have a couple of beers, um, a couple glasses of wine, whatever the case is, and I start feeling a little buzzed, right? The way I respond to alcohol is I do become, again, a little bit more jolly. I become a little bit more engaged, a little bit more um, energized and kind of excitable with, with conversations and people and being sociable. Um, and I recognize that in myself. I recognize that in kind of my response to, to alcohol typically or oftentimes. I mean, there's definitely exceptions here. But um, so now the question becomes, all right, I've had a couple of beers and I'm feeling a little, little buzzed. I'm not drunk, right? But I'm, I'm buzzed, okay? Am I more close now to my real self or further away from my real self back on sobriety? Right. Because undoubtedly when we drink and you hear this and this ties back into Sartre really nicely. So I love when things like come full circle. Uh, but when we think about kind of like, let's say we get in that zone of being like buzzed and then like drunk. And maybe we say things that we normally wouldn't otherwise say back on this end of sobriety. Mm -hmm. Right. You tell somebody, you know, what you're really thinking. You, you know, maybe kind of stir the pot on some things. You maybe. Um, confess feelings for someone that you wouldn't confess, you know, back in the sobriety stage. And we do this interesting thing where undoubtedly alcohol unlocks, again, some of these inhibitions. And that's definitely like an area that, that you know, we need to be concerned with and, and careful with. Um, but it's also really interesting as it relates to this, this move that we sometimes make of feeling more comfortable to relay thoughts to others about our reality and we've had a couple of drinks. And so the question becomes like, you know, is this more representational of like an authentic self and we just needed something to like help us drag it out, right? And that thing that's dragging it out is alcohol. And it's interesting too, and like the kind of like, let's say, okay, so you, let's say you have this like, you know, conversation is mildly buzzed or like kind of drunken conversation, you know, and you say things and then like the next day, right? And then like you can throw in like a whole nother conversation about hangovers, yada, yada, yada. But the next day you kind of like replaying the, these moments and you're like, oh my gosh, I, we finally had this conversation that I was nervous to talk about. And like, like the two predominant responses are either like, oh, I'm glad that finally happened. Now we can like keep moving in a direction because like this was like this ice was broken. Right. Or it's like, oh my God. <laughs> or it's like, oh my God, what did I say? What did I do? And, you know, we might rattle off a couple of texts or make a couple of phone calls and say, oh, my gosh, I didn't mean that I was drunk. Right. So this goes back into our conversation about sorry, where you're saying, oh, it's, you know, not it's, my it's not my fault. It's the alcohol's fault. But again, it was your choice to start consuming alcohol in the first place. And it led you to a place to relay these feelings about yourselves or about them or about reality. And so the question still maintains is like, was that more of an adequate representation of an authentic self than, uh, than when you are back over in this like sobriety state. Right. And, um, and yeah, so, I mean, that's just like, and, and usually like we get to kind of like that kind of topic in the class, usually about 
week eight or nine, kind of like after we've kind of really set a foundation where the first part of the class we talk about, I call them like the big three. So like beer, wine, and spirits. And like, you know, kind of like categorizing and compartmentalizing, you know, how each of those three are either, you know, represented in culture or like in one of my favorite examples, and this was brought up by a student, I think two years ago, and it stuck with me, you know, when we were talking about kind of like, um, categorizations of like beer and wine and like, you know, and, and ways that we think about them stereotypically or like how they like manifest in the world. And one student, you know, raised their hand was like, you know, whenever we think of like races, so like a 5k or like, you know, a 10k or half marathon or full marathon, whatever, like those little, you know, just races, whatever they might be at a lot of those races at the end of them, there's always like a beer tent. Right. And there's like a beer tent or like, you know, a brewery's got something set up like, hey, have a pie. You just ran three miles. Right. Or you just ran six miles, whatever the case may be. There's never, ever a wine tent. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, like, why is that? Like, why? Why is it the case that, like, you know, you know, this plays such an active role in like this kind of lifestyle or this kind of event, this kind of endeavor where wine hasn't like cracked that surface yet and hasn't like you know made it into that you know that sphere yet but it's not casual enough exactly sure. right but like you go to an art gallery right and there's wine so mm -hmm. like so again and this plays on like stereotypes of not only like the beverage itself but also like the people who consume the beverage potentially um yeah but it's it's interesting to like kind of like start to compart compartmentalize or at least Maybe not compartmentalize, but it's interesting to pay more attention. And that's one of my main aims in the philosophy of alcohol class is to pay more attention to where alcohol like shows up. Why is it there? Um, like what's the purpose? What's it used for? Like not just like, you know, breaking some social barriers or breaking some, um, you know, social awkwardness, but like, but why is it there? What's its intention? Um, and just like recognizing that it really is so present, right. And, and kind of like learning how to potentially be like one of the main aims for the class, especially teaching it at the college level where at most colleges and universities, there's high rates of, of binge drinking and partying like that. You know, I mean, that's just part of the, part of the college experience for many. Right. Yeah. But like hopefully either after taking this class or having some of these conversations, one of my personal you know, it hopes is that people leave, you know, um, being a little more thoughtful with their drinking habits or being a little more thoughtful with their engagement with alcohol, right? Um, that it's not just this thing to get totally blitzed, but maybe there's actually like cerebral things we can learn about ourselves. As we consume alcohol, there's cerebral things we can learn about the entities themselves, whether that be wine, beer, or spirits. Um, that's definitely an important thing to bring up on a college campus. Mm -hmm. um, and I think most people don't gen genu genuinely don't understand the effect that alcohol can have on your life until you drank in a bottle of vodka, probably, right. or just had too, too rough of a night, you're throwing up, mm -hmm. you know, someone's holding your hair back, or right? Whatever, right. right. Um, and then uh, that ties back into like, well, you chose to drink alcohol and you knew, you knew that these things could happen, right? Mm -hmm. uh, regardless of whether you're in control of choosing what you do while you're drinking, mm -hmm. you chose to drink before. Great, right? great. And there's, there's this article that we read early on in the semester and the article, I forget the author, um, and it's specifically talking about wine, but this can be extrapolated to talk about whiskey, vodka, gin, tequila, um, beer, whatever the case may be. Um, but essentially it asks the question, like, do you control the wine or does the wine control you? Right. And like this goes into questions about agency, but then like it goes into questions about, again, kind of will. It goes into questions about, um, you know, control. But then like down the line, and we usually finish – the class, um, at least a couple weeks right before the end of the class, we do talk about the nature of addiction and alcoholism and like the various kind of like serious um, components of, of, you know, 
of either those that suffer from alcohol addiction or alcoholism, or maybe have been in, you know, relationships or families that where that's been abused or been present, right? And that goes back to this question that that for some, and this is I think like again a metric or like a tipping point of um yeah, like a metric or a tipping point of of a nice way to gauge kind of one's relationship with alcohol, right? And and yeah, does one control the alcohol one is consuming or does eventually the alcohol come to control the one that's consuming it, right? And there's, this, again, this kind of like um, consideration that needs to be made. And I mean, you know, as a personal note, um, and not, you know, and I mean, I think people that, that actively consume alcohol maybe say these things all the time and it goes back to my conversation on excuses, but I've made the choice um, that I very, very rarely ever drink alone. Mm -hmm. um, that, that, you know, I do have uh, kind of, you know, some familial history of alcohol, alcoholism. And I know that I'm aware of that. Um, I also know that I really like alcohol. <laughs> like, I mean, both like professionally and personally, like I like having a drink, I like having a beer, wine, whatever the case may be. Um, but one choice that I've again tried to maintain, I do a pretty good job with is not drinking alone. Um, yeah. Not that I don't like trust myself, but um, I just think like accountability with another person. I also know that like um, I'm a pretty social drinker. Um, yeah. And and drinking is a social activity. Right. Right. Like regardless of uh, whether or not you're trying to get drunk, mm -hmm. if you're just drinking a beer with someone, it feels nice. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you know, I think it's interesting. Like, so I'm in my my early 30s, right? And um, and I really was not that much of a. I really like. I really, I mean, I really did not drink much between the ages of 21 and 24, 25. Um, and I wouldn't, I mean, like, especially like even in my undergrad experience, I, I can think of a handful of experiences with alcohol, but it was pretty minimal, all things considered. Um, so like most of my, like, most of my like experience with alcohol, both like on positive sides and negative sides, uh, has definitely taken place in the last like 10 ish years, um, like grad school and beyond. <laughs> and so it's interesting to think that like, you know, my relationship with alcohol, uh, again, and it's also been morphed and encouraged by, by it being also part of like another professional outlet right? mm -hmm. with, um, with the various jobs that I've had and the various kind of like, um, responsibilities I've had with it. And, and it's also, one thing to make mention of is like as my job as like a bartender or as my job managing the wine bar, like, like epistemologically um, thinking about knowledge, like what we know, how we know, do we know anything at all? Like alcohol is a really, really fun subject to like teach others with. Like I still am like learning all the time about like differing wines, like differing regions for wine, differing beer styles, differing kind of like, uh, uh, distillation techniques as it comes to like vodka and, and whiskey and other spirits where like in a way and then like on the professional side when somebody comes into the bar and they're like what's this or like where did this come from like it's really fun to like educate and like be part of like this process of like learning you know mm -hmm. um, where again alcohol doesn't just have to be this this you know seedy substance that exists in the dark that people just want to get hand boned on, but rather, you know, can actually like appreciate and learn. And I think that there's something to make that more of like an arc, I think, especially, especially with college students. Like one of my aims is like, again, this idea of like trying to appreciate alcohol, maybe a little more, a little bit more conscientiously, a little bit more thoughtfully rather than just being like, yep, let's go get some fireball and, you know, get down <laughs> like yeah. like like I want like one of my aims is to like have students actually recognize that there is um craft there is art there is care to a lot of these things that we consume um and then moreover uh yeah this this idea of like appreciation and, and conscientiousness and I mean and again that spans the gamut but he's also in this class um especially geared towards um college students, I mean, we spend a couple of weeks um, discussing, again, like the dangers and the harms of alcohol, including yeah. like binge drinking, including like um, um, assault and, and, and especially like sexual assault and, you know, just the way that like 
hookup culture exists mm-hmm. in the party scene and like all the dangers that can uh, potentially be there, right? So there's just there's there's so many different avenues to discuss as it relates to to alcohol. Yeah, so alcohol is just there's just a whole depth of philosophical context that you can go into there, especially with authenticity, with freedom, and especially as it relates to John Paul Sartre. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sartre. Yeah. Either or. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I wanted to say that I think a lot of times when people do drink alcohol, they take the responsibility away from themselves. Mm-hmm. And that sort of goes into that whole, the have to's and I'm choosing to, right? Mm-hmm. And when you're drinking alcohol, you, you could say, well, the alcohol chose to do that, right? right? But really, I chose to do that because your body is just made up of all these different drugs and chemical reactions and whatnot. That's all you are, really. And, and we can go into the Dennett, <laughs> sure. the Dennett thing, but... uh really you chose to drink something knowing that that would cause this effect on you where you're going to become more emotional. You're going to reveal more about yourself and you're going to do all these things, but you're still you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Like there's like, if if maybe a way of conceptualizing this is like, there is a base level of identity. Is that maybe a fair way of thinking about it? Mm -hmm. And then like, depending on what we ingest or what we consume, like differing versions of ourselves are brought out. Is that maybe what like kind of what you're thinking? Or like yeah, and but it's not just that. I mean, not just drinking alcohol. You um, you bring out a new version of yourself uh, when you go to the first day of class. Mm-hmm. You know, when you go to a job interview, mm-hmm. when you when you're dating a new person, mm-hmm. when you're uh, meeting new friends, when you're around different people, you're always constantly bringing out this side of yourself. Um, and that goes into uh, psychology where we follow these scripts, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And I just want to know, like, uh, your opinion on the whole, like, when you're drinking alcohol, um, are you choosing to do the things that you do? Great. So just to rephrase your question, like, to what level or limit of agency do we have while yeah. drinking, right? Like, mm-hmm. is that kind yeah. of interesting? I mean... I mean, my, my first answer is I don't know. <laughs> okay, yeah. um, but I think that I think that that question allows us to ask a lot of other interesting questions, right? Mm-hmm. Where like, and again, and like on in class and on the board, like we do this kind of like spectrum, if that's the right phrase to use, or this continuum of like you know, as we kind of compartmentalized a couple of minutes ago, like uh, an area of sobriety, an area of like being buzzed, an area of being drunk, right? like drunk drunk or maybe that's like another area is like drunk drunk right um and i mean i think one of the aims of how i teach the class and what i hope for the class is again that like even with there being such social especially in college some social and peer pressure when it comes to drinking right that for students to maybe pause and still recognize that they have a choice to either take that first shot have that first beer, have that first mixed drink, whatever it is. And knowing that like, again, like maybe the night will get more fun, but also it could present some issues and some, some dangers. Right. But still like at that very kind of base level, even when it feels, and I know that this is so hard to say, but like, even when it feels so difficult to potentially say, no, I'm good. I don't need that drink. Like we still have the choice to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And like, and that's, again, I think from the social from the social con- context and from the social just pressure, especially in college, peer pressure with our friends and fraternities and sororities and, you know, party, bar scene, hookup culture. Like, it's really, really hard to say, like, no, I'm good. But still, like, you have that choice, right? So let's say, okay, I choose to take that first shot. I choose to take uh, that, that, you know, have that first beer. And... Like, I mean, personally, something that like I again, like I, I've, I've, I've been, you know, drinking for like actively drinking for about a decade now, which is kind of a crazy sentence to utter. Um, but I've been 
paying more close attention to my alcohol consumption habits probably the last three to five years in particular. Mm -hmm. And like, and I know myself, especially because I am a sociable person and I am a social drinker by most accounts that I really struggle with this, right? Like, let's say I have like two beers, you know, and I'm feeling a little buzzed, right? Mm -hmm. Then that like next zone is really problematic sometimes for me where like if somebody's like, if Greg, if Greg, you're like, Hey, another beer, it's really hard for me to say no because like I'm having a good time. Right. Yeah. Um, and I recognize that about myself. I recognize that like that, that especially if somebody's like, Hey Bryce, you want a drink or can I buy you something? I'm, I'm usually one not to say no in that kind of context. And so again, like being aware of the fact that it wasn't something other than myself that made me consume that next beer, but it was still my choice to say, yep, I'll have another one. Or it's my choice to go to the bar and order another drink. Right. Now, for somebody that would have more experience kind of as it relates to the way that alcohol affects the brain, which I don't have like that scientific mm -hmm. jargon. I don't have that scientific knowledge. I mean, I've, you know, I've read various papers about kind of the inebriating and decision-making effects of alcohol, which are undoubtedly serious. And like, again, the idea of thinking that, that alcohol lowers inhibition, it lowers the ability to make, you know, really thought out decisions. Um, but again, I still, I still hope that there is something at least at like the start of the night or the start of like the, the drinking time frame that there is a recognition of agency, a recognition of choice mm -hmm. that is then followed by like the responsibility of that. And again, like uh, it's probably easier said than done, you know, because I mean, again, once you get into that stage of like being buzzed and maybe like, you know, kind of knocking on the door of like being drunk, you know, to really like affirmatively make that decision to say, nope, I'm stopping here is tough to do. Yeah. You know, and then I, I mean, I can say that firsthand experience, like that's, that's definitely been issues for me in the past. Mm -hmm. um, but that's kind of that idea of, well, I, I chose to drink this first drink. Mm -hmm. I chose to drink the second drink, mm -hmm. but am I choosing to drink the third drink? Right. Exactly. Right. And I mean, and you know, depending on your, your context, depending on your circumstance your situation, who you're with, um, you know, if you're having like a pleasant time or like maybe, maybe you're like on a first date and it's going really bad. Right. And you think that that third drink might make it better. Right. Like, like paying close attention to that context of like having that third drink of like, you know, taking a little bit of solace and like that pleasure that you get from being inebriated or like maybe you're having a first date and it's going really well. And like both you and the person that you're with, are like, yeah, let's have one more. Like this is really enjoyable. Alcohol will enhance this you know, continued connection. Right. And, and so again, like just paying, I think if, if there's a way of like describing some of my aims with the philosophy of alcohol, both the class and where potentially like this could go is just for us to pay more attention. And I, maybe that's like overly simplistic, but I also think that I think hopefully for some already that have taken the class and, and for others that I've had conversations with, I mean, hopefully it makes us all pay a little more close attention, which I think is at, at, at the most basic level of philosophical enterprise. I think mm -hmm. that philosophers and the discipline of philosophy encourages us to pay more attention to things that we just assume, to things that we just take as quote unquote normal or as natural, but really maybe require some discernment or some examination. Yeah, so, I mean, essentially, people just need to uh, be responsible for themselves and choose what to do with their own lives. Yeah, and, and, and now it's not to say that, like, and, and I'll just kind of, like, bring Sartre in here just to kind of round that out. But, I mean, Sartre very much recognizes the fact that we don't live lives in isolation, mm -hmm. right? That we are undoubtedly social beings, that we live lives relationally. And so the fact that like the choices that we make deeply affect others, both in positive and obviously negative ways. And so like really recognizing the fact that like the life that we can build, the life that we can live um, is not again, kind of like solely uh, individualistic, but is in fact like, you know, connected and concerned with others as well. So like, you know, when I choose to have a couple of beers, yeah, I might be feeling great, but I might be really, annoying to whoever I'm with. Right. And so again, like trying to take in consideration, 
you know, how does my choice or my choices affect that person or others in general, right? Um, but still, at the end of the day, yes, we are absolutely responsible for ourselves. And to deny that responsibility um, is, is one of the great dangers that Sartre sees. Well, I appreciate you having, uh, having you on. Yeah. And let's choose to end the interview. <laughs> great. Let's choose that. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, no problem.